Our next speaker is uh, Graeme Hirsch from the University of Toronto, and uh, Graeme will be talking about ethical issues in natural language processing. Thank you. My talk is going to be in two parts. Firstly, about uses of natural language processing, and then secondly, about bias in data and learning. I'll make some points related to some of the things that Joel said and give you my own perspective on them. So firstly, natural language processing by itself is a neutral technology, it's an enabling technology, and cliche, like all enabling technologies, it can be used for good or it can be used for evil. It's a canonical double-edged sword. So there are many obvious ways that we can use natural language processing for evil or the same tech for good or for the same techniques for evil. So for example, natural language processing can be used to detect fake reviews, but it can also be used to generate those fake reviews in the first place. Authorship attribution techniques can be used in historical and literary analysis to determine who wrote some uh, historically important text for which we don't know the author, but the same techniques can be used to out political dissidents who might better pr remain anonymous. It's easy to list virtuous applications of natural language processing in fields like medicine, education, machine translation for breaking down language barriers, and so on. There are many good things that natural language processing can do. But it's also equally easy to list the evil applications. Natural language processing can be used in surveillance. It can have all kinds of military applications. And of course, it can be used in targeted marketing and other kinds of sneaky ways that invade our privacy. But nonetheless, the judgments like I just gave are very value dependent and culture dependent and situation dependent, and many people would dispute them. They'd say, like it or not, for example, these are just practical applications. We need surveillance to keep us secure. We need the military to keep us safe. We need targeted marketing to make sure that we all buy the right stuff. <laughs> and that brings us to this person, Robert Mercer, who, well, he's or is or was a great computational linguist. He's been recognized by the Association for Computational Linguistics, which is the main research organization in the field, as a fellow, a very distinguished um, rank in 2014. The ACL gave him the Lifetime Achievement Award. You all know Robert Mercer's work, whether you realize it or not, because with his colleagues at IBM in the 1980s and 1990s, he developed the basis for statistical machine translation that's the foundation for all uh, machine translation work that we do today. But after he did that work, he tossed in natural language processing and went off to work or found a hedge company, Renaissance Technologies, and because he's mathematically very smart, he became a billionaire. Now, the problem is that Robert Mercer also has political opinions that many people find odious. He's a racist, he's an ultra right wing nationalist, and he uses his billions to promote those views and to get politicians who follow those views elected. So in particular, he's a part owner of Breitbart News, the ultra right wing nationalist um, new, fake news source that became prominent during the election of Donald Trump. He's a part owner of Cambridge Analytica, the firm that we heard all too much about last year in the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. So Robert Mercer is accused by many people in computational linguistics and natural language processing of basically using NLP for evil purposes, for using it to promote a racist and objectionable agenda, for using it to promote the election of a president who many people regard as uh, racist and objectionable. So for many people in the field, Robert Mercer is the evil side of natural language processing, and he provides an existence proof of what can be done if you turn the technology the wrong way. So with that in mind, what can we do to be the anti-Robert Mercer and use NLP to promote better causes in the world? I'll list just a few. Um, firstly, 
countering some of this stuff, identifying fake news, fake science, fake reviews, and so on. This is a topic that's been on the agenda of researchers in natural language processing for a number of years now, uh, mostly under the heading of detecting fake reviews on Amazon rather than fake news. But there are now workshops dedicated to it. And for Facebook and Google in the last year, it's become a corporate imperative, but it's good works nonetheless. We can do things in public safety, for example, identifying and counting countering hate speech, as Joelle also alluded to, trolling and bullying, and identifying sexual predators in social media is another area that we've been looking at. In addition, an application of natural language processing that hasn't had a lot of attention yet, but might be upcoming, is providing better access to legal services, for, especially for disadvantaged people who can't afford a lawyer. So, up to now, most natural language processing in the area of law has been to assist lawyers to be more productive. But what we're starting to see now is NLP systems and chatbots that can give consumers direct access to simple legal services like drafting wills, um, drafting objections to landlords, um, fighting traffic tickets, and so on. And at a meta level, I also want to mention good works and ethics at the level of research itself. The natural language processing field was one of the earliest to adopt the ethics of open publication and open sharing of data. And it continues doing this very much to this day. Just about everything that's been published in natural language processing is freely available as an open publication at the ACL anthology. Now, in the second part of my talk, I want to turn to the question of inequities and biases that arise in our systems. So the first class of these is inequities and biases that arise from choices that are made by researchers or choices that are forced upon researchers, often by inherent limitations in our methods or in our resources. And these have been characterized as exclusion. Firstly, linguistic exclusion. So for obvious reasons, we don't need to go, go into the details, overwhelmingly the work in research in natural language processing is based on English. And we have theories out there and systems out there and resources out there and software out there that's all organized around English. And the consequences of that are that even researchers who work in non-English speaking countries often end up spending more of their time working on systems for English than they do for their own language. And the result, sorry, let me go back one. The result is generally a vicious circle where because more resources are created for English, that's what researchers work on, they get their publications, and we go round and round. And the result is that we don't even have semantic resources or syntactic tree banks or other things for many, many of the largest languages in the world. And no surprise, many of those languages are the languages of developing countries. The second kind of exclusion that we have in research is demographic exclusion, which is that when we train our linguistic models, we tend to train them on writing that is done by white middle-aged males. The exception for this is work that's done on social media, but that's one part of it. If you look at web corpora, or if you look at the single most important corpus that's driven an awful lot of research in natural language processing, the Wall Street Journal corpus, the authors tend to be male, they tend to be white, they tend to be middle-aged. Now, when researchers latched onto the Wall Street Journal corpus, because it was there, the thought was, well, language is language, English is English. The Wall Street Journal should be fully representative of the English language. What we've started to learn is, no, it ain't. And the systems that we develop based on statistics from the Wall Street Journal give poorer performance on text if that text is written by women, if that text is written by ethnic minorities, or even if that text is written by people who differ in age from the sort of middle age spread that we get around journalists in the Wall Street Journal. So that relates to um, inequities that arise from choices or 
made by researchers or choices forced on researchers. I want to now turn to inequities and bias that arises from our methods and our data. So the first kind of bias we can have is if we learn discrimination from training data that's explicitly biased in the first place, well, no surprise, the system is going to learn that bias, except all too often it is a surprise because nobody expected that bias to be there in the first, case, first place. So the data itself or the selection of the data leads to the bias. And I'll give you two examples. The first recently published Amazon um, I guess reluctantly published the fact that they'd been experimenting with a system that would look at job applicants' resumes and try to pick out the really top few percent from them. And the problem with the system was that it was trained on past decisions and it downgraded resumes submitted by women. It learnt that the word women's itself was a negative flag. It learnt that the names of some women's colleges in the United States were negative flags, and it learnt that words that tend to turn up more on male resumes, like captured and executed, were good words. Um, fortunately, Amazon apparently never put this into production because they recognised the bias. Another one which shows just how odd this can get, I suppose, a system that was designed to look for uh, hate speech, toxic comments in social media, learnt to flag words especially names of identity groups like the word gay itself as toxic because these words turned up in toxic comments and they were just learnt as bad words along with the other truly bad words. But more usually that's not how it happens. More usually the bias that's learnt by these systems is latent in the sense that it comes from what we might call a natural imbalance in the data. That is, the data that we have either doesn't reflect the world, or maybe it does, but it doesn't reflect the world as we'd like it to be. And very often, we're training these systems exactly because we want to avoid this bias in the first place. So here's an example um, related to one of the examples that Joel gave, pronoun gender in Google Translate. So not all languages, like English and French, put gender on pronouns. Turkish is one that doesn't. So if you have sentences like, she is a doctor, he is a nurse, and put them through Google Translate into Turkish, the pronouns are translated correctly into the gender-neutral Turkish pronoun, O. Oh. But if you then take those Turkish sentences and translate them back into English, O oh is translated as he in the context of is a doctor, and she in the context of is a nurse. Now, I'll turn to word embeddings. Joel also mentioned these. Um, so I don't, maybe don't need to explain quite as much what word embeddings are for the non-technical among you, but just to say that they're high-dimensional vector representations of word meanings, and they're derived from large corpora of text looking at how words occur in their contexts of occurrence. And I don't need to explain we don't need to know here why they're called embeddings. We just need to know that the distance in vector space between two embeddings represents the degree of similarity of meaning of those words. Now, what's been discovered is that these vector differences between vector representations can also represent relationships between words. So if we take the arithmetic difference between the vector for Paris and the vector for France, that gives you the capital of relationship because it's the same as the vector difference between Tokyo and Japan. Likewise, man and woman is roughly the same as the distance between king and queen, between king and man and queen and woman. That gives us the gender and royalty relations. And we can cast these as um, analogies. Paris is to France as Tokyo is to Japan. Man is to woman as king is to queen. King is to man as queen is to woman. Now that's fine. That's all true in the English language. But the trouble is what we also find is these. We find man is to woman as doctor is to nurse, just as in the Google example. Man is to woman as computer programmer is to homemaker, as carpentry is to sewing, as architect is to interior designer, as brilliant is to lovely, as chuckle is to giggle, and as pizzas is to cupcakes. <laughs> so 
this leads us into then second order bias when we start to use these word embeddings. So when we have a biased data or a method that's got latent bias in it and we start to use that method, then we've got this second order bias where, let me go back, where our system is going to be biased but we don't even know necessarily that it's biased or what the source of the bias is. It might be the word embeddings, it might be something else. It's kind of hard to say. And an example of that is the kind of bias and sometimes non-bias found in sentiment analysis systems in an analysis by um, Kirichenko and Mohammed. And Saif will be talking about that, I understand, in his next talk in just a moment. So can we correct this bias? There's been a lot of work on debiasing word embeddings. Um, Joel mentioned the work by Bolak Basi, the footnote down there. Their attempt was to identify the gender direction in vectors and simply remove it from gender neutral words while keeping it on gen truly gendered words like say sister. Um, Bullock ba I was a little surprised by Joel's example because Bullock Barsi actually went to some lengths to show that their debiased uh, word vectors still worked well even though, I guess, you can find examples where they don't. They've also been work on trying to avoid this latent bias in the first place by using learning methods that can put the biased information to certain components of the vector where you can then subsequently ignore it. So, in conclusion, I've talked about inequities that arise from limitations of our research methods and our resources, and there always will be such inequities because even when we fix those problems by methods like debiasing methods, once we get those sorted out well, well that'll just take us down to the next method, the next layer where we're sure to find similar inequities and similar biases and we'll need to do more work. But that's okay, that's still progress and eventually we hope we will get to systems that can be truly unbiased in use and used for good, not for evil. Thank you.